Okay, so this is kind of almost after we're through with this, this is in some ways the halfway uh, point. And um, I wanted to mention to everybody, today we're going to talk, this is lecture eight, and today we're going to talk about um, team tools and hypothesis testing. Um, now just a quick check, can people see my screens? should say lecture eight, team tools and hypothesis testing. Let me know if you can see that. Yes, we can see it, Mark. Okay, great. Great. Okay, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to cover some basic team tools, and in particular, um, something called a BAM session um, that I know Shani and Sue are familiar with. Tracy and Jimmy may not be, and the others may not be as well. But it's kind of a combination of those team tools that's so common and so helpful um, that I've given it its own name. I call it a BAM session. Um, and uh, I think you'll, you'll like it. Um, we're going to try and actually do one uh, remotely, and we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, in some ways, you guys are going to be the guinea pigs on this. I have done it before, but uh, never in a re live recording. So we'll see on that one. Um, anyway, here's the agenda for today. Let me shut down my console so it's not blocking everything. I don't know if you can see that or not. Uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, with Q&A and a brief review of Lecture 7, which was largely, in fact, I think entirely about lean. Um, so let's start out with with that, are there any questions about what we covered last time, which was overview of Lean, um, some nuts and bolts tools, value stream mapping, process analysis, 5S, and uh, waste walk, All right? And then some uh, solutions, quick changeover, which was also called single minute exchange of diet. That's a really Lean largely comes from manufacturing, so you'll find some things that are very manufacturing named, but it works just fine in the office. Uh, single minute exchange of dye is often is what's called the quick changeover in most places these days. Um, uh, we talked about load balancing. These are concepts that are probably pretty common to you already, but um, but they can be tricky. Kanban is probably the most tricky, and keep in mind it doesn't always apply. This batch batching and one piece flow and Kanban, they're great ideas. They work when they work. And uh, that's when we should think about it, right? It's, it's basically, as I believe it was Brad who said this last time, uh, many of these things are red flags for you to say, hey, I wonder if this particular solution, like load balancing or cell design, um, making workflow into a cell, um, if that's going to help. And, and part of it is then you can look back and see, well, what wastes did I really see? Did I see a lot of transportation waste? Oh, good. Maybe that's due to, uh, maybe I can use a cell design to help that. Did I see a lot of inventory waste and a lot of delays? Hmm. Maybe I ought to look at batching. Maybe I ought to look at load balancing um, and so forth. Uh, if, it's, if it's really a big time inventory, maybe Kanban is really going to help me and uh, so forth. So that's really what we talked about last time. Um, so I guess I'll open it up one more time and say, does anybody have any uh, direct questions with respect to that? I see a couple of people have uh, come back on. Looks like John has joined us. I'm here. Hi, John. Oh, great. I can hear you, too. <laughs> hey. Yeah, sorry about uh, being an accidental dictator on Tuesday. No problem. All right. Um, since there are no direct questions, um, let's move on. Um, I, I want to also mention that uh, I hope that you're progressing on uh, on assignment number three. It's a biggie. I understand that, and uh, but it's a real important one to kind of get down. Um, so uh, make sure that you're doing that. Uh, in particular, make sure you're having the discussion with the person and that, you, uh, that you're assigned to. And if you haven't yet had that discussion, make sure it gets on the calendar so it happens. Um, and that discussion was around, I believe, three things. One is the reading in uh, uh, bringing out the best in people, uh, where we're talking about reinforcement and, and, and punishment. And I think it was chapters seven through nine. The, the other is, um, really want you to start talking about um, the visualizing uh, quantitative information. 
um, and what are some thoughts and, and ideas behind that. If you haven't yet taken the Stephen Few quiz, take it. It only takes, I said five minutes, it takes less than five minutes if you're looking through it. And um, it's well worth doing it. If any of you have heard of Edward Tufte, uh, a lot of this stuff originally came from Edward, Ed, Edward, Edward Tufte, who's kind of the granddaddy of um, thinking about how do we display quantitative data so that it's assimilated quickly and understood really well. Um, and um, you'll see it makes a, little things make huge differences. Um, I, I will have uh, an online lecture uh, posted on that uh, by next Monday, which is part of week four. Um, but that's just meant to be a, uh, a, an introduction uh, to it, and we'll, we'll hopefully have some nice robust discussion. But for now, just take that quiz, and then there's a follow-up. I'd like you to read one article from Perceptual Edge, which is Stephen Pugh's website. Same guy who brought you uh, Save the Pies for Dessert. Um, so, um, so anyway, there's that. And um, you should also, by next Tuesday morning, all of you should have uh, your, your weeks five through eight binders in your, uh, in your mailbox. So the Connecticut Air folks, check with Teresa. That's who it was sent to. Everybody else had it sent directly. Um, Jim, because of, uh, because of the upstairs, downstairs thing that I've got, I've asked, uh, yours needs to be signed for. So just be aware that there's probably going to be a delivery Tuesday morning. And if it's not there, they call UPS, or I, which they should probably leave a sticker or something like that. Well, the um, UPS guy knows where we are. He's a friend of ours, so it, it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I was just mentioning that just because, you know, last time there was some mix-up with ups, upstairs, downstairs. So I just uh, asked for a signature at this time. Sure. Uh, just make sure it gets there to you. All right. Um, all right, so that's about it. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is the halfway this is a halfway point in terms of the lectures, um, not in terms of the work, not in terms of the projects. Um, and um, next week we're going to be doing a lot more. Uh, we're going to finish up on some team tools, hypothesis testing today. Next week we're going to talk a lot about um, uh, regression modeling, um, and in particular. And uh, for that, we're going to be using a mini tab mostly. Some of it can be covered in Excel Stats, and Excel Stats does a tremendously good job for just the basic stuff, uh, which is great. Um, uh, but if you can, if you don't yet have mini tab, make sure that you download the demo just so that you can see how it all works, and so uh, you can follow the lectures a little bit more easily. Um, I think even if you're a green belt, that might help. Um, because there are some things that are kind of mini tab exclusive in terms of the the, the checking. I, I really apologize for that. It's, it's too bad that there's so many, first of all, that, that the standard is so expensive um, and that too, that there's just so many different things that you can do. But that's how analysis is and it's fast and it's moving quickly. So um, you know, it's changing every day. So there's a lot of different tools that are there. I tend to like using the Excel tools, but that's kind of like me it's kind of like the old adage about you know when you when you have a hammer everything looks like a nail. Um, I, you know I've had to use Excel so much that, I, that I've become pretty good at it. So so that's that. Or or maybe everything looks like a spoon or whatever. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for that joke by the way, John. I appreciate that. That was good. Um, okay. Um, so one last thing is that um, next week you'll uh, or over the weekend. Um, I'm also going to post a number of, of videos that have been recorded. One on lean metrics, uh, one on sampling in the central limit theorem, uh, one on hypothesis test, which is what we're going to cover today, but I'll cover it in a rather freeform way, uh, one on ANOVA, and one on visual quanti uh, quantification. You can use those to go back, but they're really going to be sort of covering the slides and things like that. So if you want to look at them, I'll try and keep them very short um, and to the point. Um, but if you're taking notes on a slide that might be on the slides for this week, that might be helpful. If we didn't cover it directly in the lecture. Okay. Having said that, um, uh, one last thing I want to cover in sort of the, the uh, review here is that I want to make sure we are going to be posting, just like I did for the data for weeks one through four, 
we're going to post the data for weeks five through eight, and that's all ready for you. And I wanted to make sure that you knew that um, along with the data, there are templates and tools. And the templates, we'll actually use uh, one of them uh, today, one of the tools. The templates have things like individuals charts, Gantt charts, there's a FMEA friend, uh, as well as some other things, um, sigma level calc, um, and lots of stuff that's in there. Uh, the tools, and you know, sometimes I mess this up in terms of what's a tool, what's a template. The tools are things I think you can be used more flexibly. So we covered, for example, for one of the things that we covered was this whole numcat system of choosing, you know, what I'm not going to go through that again because I've gone through that a lot, and, and I think people are going to. I've gone through it ad, inf uh, ad infinitum, and some people would say ad nauseum. I think, um, but um, uh, I've also put together. If you don't, you know, sort of like drawing the box all the time, I put up an analysis grid, and this is just to start getting you thinking about, you know, when I have a tool, this says, well, if I have a a cat output and I have a cat input, I'm going to be looking at things in. Let me color this a different color so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to be looking at things in, say, this uh, blue category right there. So it tells me what the plots are, and it tells me what the tests might be. <coughs> what plots might I use and what hypothesis tests might I use. And you can use this for many tests. I don't pretend that this is exhaustive. It's, there's no way it is. But it's a good place to get you started, and it's, good, it, it's enough to do, to do the blocking and tackling on all the statistics. So, for example, if you're drawing out your box and you say, well, my output is cycle time and my, inti uh, my input is, well, I want to know if cycle time varies by department. Well, cycle time is a, is a num and department is a cat, so I'm going to be looking at num cat right here. Make that up. Back to uh, white. There we go. So if I want to make a plot, well, maybe I'll look at a box plot or maybe I'll look at histograms by, by department. Okay, or if I'm doing a test, maybe I'll look at a two sample T or maybe a, a test of two variances. So <clears throat> that's kind of what I'm looking at right here. Okay, so I, I, first of all, I wanted to mention that to you, that that's there uh, in case you get tired of drawing the box and using Excel stats. Um, and another thing that's in here, and I think maybe more of you will be uh, up on this one, is a PDF version of the Dometic Navigator. Uh, now, apparently, my, my Adobe uh, has updated, so we're going to have to watch it processing pages. I don't know what it is about Adobe. They seem to want to make updates every day or five times a week or whatever. But anyway, in the Demac Navigator, um, I don't pretend that this is exhaustive either, but it should give you an idea of sort of what are the different things in each step what are the tools that you might use? What are the deliverables? Those are on the left-hand side. And what are the key tools that you might use? So if you're working in Define, you might want to look and say, well, do we have a business case yet? Do we have, a, have we really solidly linked to the customer? Do we have our high-level macro map? Do we have a high-level view of the process? Do you understand what my key outputs are? Do I have a team? Do I have a project? If I do, I'm ready for that toll gate. If I don't, you know, maybe I ought to use one or more to help me deliver on those. And by the way, and, and in measure, same thing. Okay, in analyze, same thing. I haven't covered all the analysis tools, but um, you'll see that I've given some, a, a, a large number of them. And the same thing in improve, same thing in control. On the back end of this is checklist and prep questions. So if you're going into, say, a defined toll gate, here is kind of on the left-hand side is for the team to say, hey, have we done this? So in Define, do I really have a clear and realistic goals? Or, or A, do I, have multi, do I have clear and realistic goals? If I don't, or if my team feels I don't, maybe I ought to go back and check. So you can use this maybe along with DECON to help make sure your project's on track and that you've covered the bases. On the right-hand side are questions that if you're doing reasonable preparation for any sort of meeting with uh, stakeholders or with, um, with the steering committee or whatever in DMAIC projects, you ought to be prepared for these sorts of things. So, for example, um, you know, 
yeah, I don't know exactly when I'm going to end this project. I don't know exactly, but do I have a timeline and a plan for it? You bet I better have, because I know that question is going to come. I know some senior leader <laughs> or some manager or some stakeholder is going to ask me, when are we going to be done with this? All right? Okay, and so forth. You know, in measure, um, have, we uh, have we adequately checked the stability of our KOVs? If we haven't yet, it should give us pause. So, you know, I, I, I'm not a slave to all these rules, but I, f I think a lot of people find this uh, pretty helpful. And incidentally, one of the reasons why in the book, uh, one of the third or fourth slides is basically this right here, what's on page five of your navigator, with the different things highlighted, is I'm trying to show you the roadmap of where the tools that we're covering in that section are occurring generally in the Danaic process. Okay, so it gives you an idea of, oh, okay, I get where this tool is happening. All right, so hopefully that was helpful. So I'm going to move on, and we'll talk about team tools um, if there are no additional questions. Okay, so uh, what we'll cover in team tools... And, and this is, um, let's see if I can pull this up very quickly. This is um, the stuff that's covered in, oh, starting on slide 72 in your text. So it's like 71 to 92. And um, like I said, I'd like to cover uh, something kind of specific. So there's a few tools that I'd like to cover. And... Um, this is covering the team tools. And I think if you haven't done these before, you'll find, uh, you'll find that these are some of the most useful tools, not only in Six Sigma projects, but in lots of other things as well. Some more useful than others. And I like to think of diverging tools and converging tools because that's kind of what we want to do. So we want to create, in a Six Sigma project, we want to create, sort of, kind of think of it like the, I don't know if I can draw this very well, Looks like a wine glass, but it's supposed to be the thing that you put in your in your oil to fill up your oil or a, or a kitchen to get it into a small hole, right? It's a funnel. So in the beginning, we want we want lots of ideas for what we can do. So here we'll talk about things like brainstorming, all right? Brainstorming is the key tool uh, that we're going to use to to generate all the different types of ideas that we can. Um, but then we need to converge all of these things. And this is a constant struggle. Do we have enough ideas? Oh, God, we've got too many ideas. Let's see if we can look for some commonality and put them back together and get a different picture. Um, and for this converging piece right there, we're going to look at two tools. They're grouping tools. One is called Affinity, which is my favorite, and one is called Fishbone, which is widely used and also good. And then... We want to decide for our priorities what to go deep on. And so we use a prioritization tool called multi-voting. We'll cover that in this lecture, but there are some other things that we can use as well. We'll find out later we can use something called Decision Guru, which is a oops, trademark name, sorry, um, which is a tool I think you can use to, to more rationally prioritize. But multi-voting, great team tool. I think you'll, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. And then we'll have some things that help us go, go really deep. So those are the statistical tools that we'll look into. But also in the team tool section, we'll be talking about an interrelationship diagraph. Diagram. Okay. And we'll be talking about five whys or why why analysis. A lot of people call it five whys. I'll tip my hat to fashion at the moment and call it five whys. So that's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover brainstorming, affinity, fishbone, um, ID, uh, and five whys in this section. I think we can do it fairly quickly. Now there's a, a, a certain sequence that I really like that I call a BAM session. And what this means is I start out by brainstorming. It, it, it's exactly what it looks like. This is brainstorming. I don't need to write it out. You guys can see it. This is brainstorming. Uh, a stands for affinity, and M stands for multi-vote. And sometimes you can have a meeting. If you plan it right, you can do it in, in 
an hour or less, even teaching people what the things are, um, and uh, really come out with some really key ideas and a cool team picture of what are the ideas that we can look at, as well as um, which ones we think are the high priority ideas that we ought to look at. You can use it for defects. You can use it for categorizing and, and understanding defects. You can use it for customers, understanding customers more deeply or customer concerns. And so we use it a lot. Okay, so that's called a BAM session. Uh, that's, at least that's what I call it. All right. <coughs> All right. So um, let's let's uh, let us, as the rabbit said, get back to uh, where we were. So I want to talk a little bit about um, about uh, you know what? I'll go back to my blackboard here. Now let's talk about brainstorming for just a minute here. So let's talk about brainstorming. I'm sure most of you have done brainstorming before. Okay, and this is this discussion is found on slides uh, 75 to 70 uh, to 77. Um, but uh, I'd like you to think a little bit. Let's take 15 seconds and let's just write down. You can brainstorm, <laughs> brainstorm the things that you think are kind of important ideas or thoughts about brainstorming. If you've held a brainstorming session before, what are just some different observations or rules um, that you've thought of? Okay, like for example, uh, in brainstorming, um, sometimes uh, a, a people say a rule is um, uh, no idea is a bad idea. Okay, there's no criticism. All right, so that might be an example. All right, so I'd like you to take 15 seconds and think about that, and then we will um, whiteboard a uh, or blackboard a, our, our ideas, capture some. Of Okay, what else should I write down here? What are some things, um, Jim? What what's an idea that you had in terms of uh, you know what's what's a good idea to, to have in a brainstorm? Well, uh, most of the brainstorming sessions that I've been in, um, they they really don't set any rules, and I, I think it's really important at the beginning is to set rules on how the brainstorming session is to be conducted. Okay, so set some so so. So what I would say is, uh, would you say is ha uh, state rules, state rules right. in front? Got it. Great. I love that. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Let me let me put Tracy on the spot. Uh, so Tracy, what what is something? What's an observation that you've had about brainstorming sessions? Hmm. Um, I think it's important to know your audience. Um, and whether or not they're going to be comfortable brainstorming in, in terms of which brainstorming tool you're going to use. Ah, okay. Good. So, so um, could you give us maybe a concrete example of that? Um, sure. If, you're, uh, if you have a bunch of staff level people that you're brainstorming with and you're brainstorming, um, oh, what's going to make the boss more effective, you might want to let them write their ideas down and share the brainstorm that way and get all the ideas up there so that people don't know who said what first. Yeah. Um, however, if it's a comfortable uh, group of people and there's trust in the room, they can just, and you've got a lot of uh, pushy people like me, then they will just throw out their ideas. <laughs> uh huh. Got it. And got it. It's not an emotional or, you know, sensitive topic you're brainstorming. Got it. I, I, I like that. So, so sometimes having something that's silent or anonymous so that people don't know. Um, At least to start it, yeah. Right. Or um, sometimes when you have somebody who dominates, maybe um, um, uh, uh, you might have to have like a round robin participation or something like that to make sure everybody gets a voice. Otherwise, yeah. like you said, people like me and, and you will, will be you know, the people who talk all the time. Okay, great. That's excellent. All right, Shani and Sue? Similar to what Tracy was saying, that um, ensuring that everyone has an opportunity to share um, a, an idea and that um, 
putting forth the ground rule that it's a no judgment zone, like you had indicated, no bad idea, but kind of stating that we're going to throw the ideas down, but we're not going to judge them right now. We're just going to get as many ideas down as we can. Yeah, excellent. So I, I like that. I like that. So the idea is it's quantity. Let's put it this way, quantity, not quality, right? We want a high quantity of ideas. We're not, we'll take quality ideas, but that's not the focus. That's not the focus. Okay, excellent, excellent. And um, uh, John? Yeah, I think that um, setting the parameters and boundaries of where you're looking for creative ideas on is important. I just came from a meeting about emergency medicine, emergency department redesign, and the discussions, the brainstorming, wanted in flow throughout the entire hospital, and I actually had to accommodate that response, but I also had to say I need the brainstorming to be within this scope of work, not other areas that are outside the scope. Yeah, so I'm going to paraphrase that as maybe set some constraints. Yes, absolutely. Know the constraints. Yeah, yeah. The, other, um, the, other, the other input I have into brainstorming is separating the goals of listing brainstorming ideas from defending and justifying why my idea is better than your idea. Yes. Uh, uh, right. So, um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is generally I, I, forget, I forget there's a word, there's a, there's a Japanese phrase for, um, for doing that that actually um, talks about the process of brainstorming. It actually separates the elements from idea collection to quali qualifying and quantifying and prioritizing the idea. Yes. Um, right. So I got it. So I think I, I, I've got it. So I, the way that I uh, see that sort of a thing coming up is, yeah, it's not about defending your idea. It's not about explaining what the idea is either. It's just about putting it out there um, and, and, and not going to the depths of it. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is I like to set time limits. Um, some other observations I've known is set time limits. Time limits. Um, that I find that to be helpful. Um, I also find um, uh, setting, um, um, uh, you might want to give, give, uh, give the team a challenge, set a, set a, set a goal. Now, you, you know my opinion about stretch goals and all this, but sometimes if you say, hey, I think we can generate, I, I, I bet we can generate 50 ideas in, in, within 10 minutes. Uh, sometimes it seems uh, people don't believe it, and then you can, but, but they can readjust um, uh, where they, where they want to be. You have to be careful with that a little bit. Um, and um, uh, Mark, Brad here. Yeah, hi, Brad. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not on my computer, but uh, oh, okay. one of the things I, one of the rules I like to implement is, uh, you know, hand out stickies, and everybody, it's a three sticky rule. You have to write down at least three ideas on a sticky. Uh, love it, love it. Okay, so hand out, hand out stickies. Right, so I like doing stickies too, and that's part of the whole BAM session, as you'll see, uh, or hopefully you'll see. You won't be able to, you actually won't be able to contribute on, on this one if you're, if you're not on the computer session, but, uh, but that's okay. Um, um, yeah, so, so there's lots of different ideas. There's lots of different variants. I like the stickies because then you're not, you're not the bottleneck. Um, I, unfortunately, I'm gonna have I'm gonna be the facilitator this time. But sometimes, if if we're having like a, a flip chart, we're writing down ideas, which is what we're doing right now. Then the facilitator becomes the bottleneck for the flow of ideas, and it slows things down. So if you can do it face to face with sticky notes, I, I much prefer that because it it it, it encourages the whole uh, participation through an anonymity. Uh, when you do round robins, people have at least three or something like that. You can you can do that. Um, one other thing, I, there's so many different variants of, of brainstorming. I don't want to get into them too much, but um, one of the ones that I've actually found helpful is when I have a team and they're just so focused on we can't do any better and why are you here trying to make us improve, um, I sometimes say, okay, you know what, you guys do such a great job. What would be the things that we could do to make it worse? And we start out with doing five minutes of what are all the things that we could do to make it worse? Um, now, you don't want to use those ideas, but sometimes you can look at them and say, 
and, and it loosens people up and sometimes you can actually turn them around. So um, it's just an idea that I found occasionally helpful. Use it sparingly. Uh, I want to make one more comment on uh, something that I believe Jim and uh, certainly John talked about, and that is the setting some constraints. Um, a lot of people feel that creativity has to have no bounds. Studies have shown, many, many studies have shown that that's actually not true. That the most creative, in most creative situations, there are some constraints. And so setting reasonable constraints is often uh, a great way to do it. Uh, setting time limit constraints is, is, is a nice thing uh, that you can do. Setting uh, some upfront constraints about what can be done as well. Uh, is is helpful. So let's let's um, in order to illustrate this, and I, I'm just going to do this pretty quickly. Um, let me just do a um, um, if if all of you are still on the uh, or for those of you who are on the computer, I'm going to clean up my desktop. Now, this is not 5s. This is just shoving everything under the rug. Okay, I'll skip that one. Right. Oh, and I want to leave my Excel stats out because we'll be using it. Okay, so I'm just going to clean my desktop just a little bit. And you can see I have a bunch of temporary files. That's that's actually for you guys. I unpack those every week. Um, okay, and so we've not, now we've got a nice clean slate. And uh, what I want us to to to, uh, to brainstorm is um, um, why do people now? Hopefully that. This, this is a good illustration because it, it works for a lot of people. Why do people why do people come late to meetings? If you're like most companies, many, many meetings, uh, there's lots of people who come late and it's a it's a real problem because people wait, they repeat things. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why people might come late to meetings. It could be a real problem. Let's see if we can brainstorm some of those and uh, just as an illustration. And so what I'd like you to do is I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to open up a clock here. All right, that's my uh, countdown clock. All right. And uh, I'm going to put five minutes on the time, um, but what I'd like us to do is, if you can, if you have a piece of paper, let's write down, uh, try and write down, what uh, Brad said three, that sounds good. Let's take one minute to write down uh, a few reasons why you think people come late to meetings, okay? So I'll put one minute on the clock, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll, uh, I'll ask you to stop. So uh, if everybody's all set. And there's no bad ideas here, right? So if we were talking about the ways that we could use a, a, a rake, you know, a, an answer of, hey, I could use it to rake leaves or I could use it to unstick a basketball that's on the roof are both acceptable answers, okay? So remember, we're talking about why do people come late to meetings. Okay, is everybody all set? Let's go, one minute. Okay, uh, I'd like to stop this now, and um, let's see. Okay, so let's take some of your um, ideas, and, and again, normally if you're doing this face-to-face, -face, um, if you're doing this face-to-face, -face, um, this can be uh, 
this can be uh, fairly uh, easy to do, and people have already written them on sticky notes or whatever. Um, but and I see we lost Tracy, unfortunately, on the on the uh, on the internet. Uh, so let's just start with um, um, let's just kind of walk around uh, the room. Just so let's start with Jim, and maybe you could tell. Uh, uh, well, you know what? I'll I'll tell mine first. I'll share. Uh, I'll share one of mine, and then we'll just kind of walk around Ron Robin, and um, and we'll we'll share what the ideas are that we had. Um, okay, so um, I'll sh I'll share mine uh, first, um, and and that is that. Uh, now, just keep in mind, if I were going to be doing this in real in a real situation, I would have taken time to give ground rules, analogies, and examples. As you saw me attempt to give one. Um, and I would also put a time limit on our session that we're doing now, because in reality, I don't want, just want three answers from everybody. I'd love to get ten. So the idea is that those three answers kind of spur some other ideas from other people. So I'll start out with one of mine, and then we'll go to Jim, and then John, and then Shani, and Sue. And anybody else who's on the line, you can tell me. So one of the things is to go to, because I have other meetings. Okay. Jim, would you like to share one? Well, I, I know that this was meant for me, Mark, but then I rethought it, and mine would be, why do I not show up at all? But <laughs> why? Um, so no it's, uh, no, it's not meant for the, you. It's meant for everybody. It was a joke, Mark. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> um, inability to say no. OK. Uh, John? Oops, did we lose John? Looks like we lost John. Don't think I have him muted. Okay, um, let's go on to Shani and Sue. Um, people have back-to-back -back meetings. Now, one of the things you should be noticing is I'm not writing a, a heck of a lot. All right, uh, that was... I think that was Sue. Shani, did you have one? Uh, just that people are busy. Okay. Um, uh, Brad, are you on the line? Okay. Um, let's go back to uh, mine now. Um, had to go to the bathroom. Not me now, <laughs> but had to go to the bathroom before the meeting. Okay, Jim? Uh, poor scheduling. Okay, Shani? Um, acceptable in the culture. Okay. Uh, Sue? Um, I have the last meeting ran overtime and late. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a that that happens a lot. Okay, John, do I have you back on the line? Tracy. Okay, uh, I'll list the uh, Brad. Okay. I'll list uh, mine. Uh, meeting not of high va not high value. Okay. All right, Jim. Uh, yeah, I had priorities down. I guess that's covered by not how you know. I, you, 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 there's only so much time in the day, and I think you have to prioritize your meetings. Okay, got it. I'll put not high priority. High priority. Not quite the same thing, so we'll we'll put it that way. And, you know, it's it's good to even list things that you think are uh, not quite dupes. I mean, there's plenty of other time to do that outside the brainstorming session. Okay, let's just get a couple more. So, Shani. Uh, actually, all of mine have already been said. Okay. Do you have any other ideas? Off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Sue? Um, all my ideas have been said, but maybe um, some people are just always late for everything. 
Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, okay, some people... You know, some people are always early, some people are always on time, some people are always late. I'm always late. Okay. All right, okay. great. Um, I want to add one. Uh, it's a, uh, you, you put it's acceptable in the culture. Um, uh, uh, I'm not interested in uh, beginning topics. So I show up late. Okay. Anybody else have any to add? Okay. Now, now, um, for those of you who are still on the line, uh, I know there's a few people who are. Um, uh, what I've done is I've given everybody um, the. Oh, good. And I've seen. I, I see Tracy has come back because I wanted Tracy to to see this as well. So, so this is kind of what we what we have. And and the, notice that I haven't given any order. And that's the problem with brainstorming, or the, the good and the bad uh, with brainstorming, is that it's just out there, right? So if we if we wanted to add various things, like in this case, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve uh, different items. Probably, if we really thought about it, we could get all sorts of other things, you know, like um, you know, watch, uh, cell phone. Uh, went dead, you know, um, um, <laughs> right? all sorts of things like that. There's plenty of reasons why they can, why they can come up. Okay, so what I've done is, um, so, so where do you go from here? So now I've got a mess of ideas. How do I make sense of, how do I make sense of it? What I've done is I've given all of us the controls and uh, in just a minute, I'd like us to do something called an affinity. So we've done brainstorming, and now what I'd like us to do is to do an affinity diagram. And, and you'll see how it works. For those of you who have done it uh, already, it, you know that it can work some, some real magic. Um, now, I'm going to be a bit space constrained on this, but um, um, so I'm going to close down my Excel clock. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea of what a, a finished affinity diagram will be, is it'll show some order to all of these things, and it'll also give us some idea of, uh, of what we will call all the different, uh, all these different uh, types of reasons why people came late to meetings. So, um, so what I'd like us to do is uh, here we I'm going to spread these out a little bit so we can read them. And hopefully, you can still see my screen. Again, normally you'd have more of these, so it'd be even harder to do. So this is this is a good number for for this. And and now what we're going to do is we're going to silently. And this is the key thing. If you're doing this in a room, you want to run an affinity session with plenty of room for people to move in and out to actually pick up the sticky notes, notes and move them around. You would also um, like to have. Um, um, uh, uh, basically a big area of a wall, if you could, to handle all these things so you give people some room to move them around. Now, we don't have quite that, but the good thing is, you know, we're not going to write on the walls. So, uh, so basically what's, what happens now is you give people a time, and, and this usually takes, with a real problem, maybe 10 to 15 minutes max, and you give them some time to move things around, and here's what they're going to do. It's called affinity because Affinity means closeness, and what we're going to do is we're going to put closeness ideas in con of ideas in connection with closeness of the sticky notes, okay, with physical closeness. So, for example, if I think that no watch and cell phone went dead are basically very, very similar, I would, I would pick one up and move it and move it there, okay? That makes sense to everybody, and now um, maybe somebody else would have a different idea, and they can move that. Uh, make these a little bit smaller if I can, just to get a little more room. Um, they can move things around, and uh, and put it to their liking. Uh, but usually, it doesn't. Uh, there there isn't too much movement that has to happen before patterns emerge, and the group comes up with a a grouping that makes sense to them. And then, by the way, the magic of this is. 
guess what? The team owns that then because they created that, and it's something that you can actually communicate well with. All right, so so let's go ahead and do that. And uh, normally you'd have everybody do it at once, but I'm going to ask people to kind of do it in order. You should be able to um, move your mouse, and we'll move my mouse on my screen. So um, let's start out with um, with Sue and Shani. So I'll, I'll ask you guys to take a moment. I know you're both working on the same computer. So take um, take. Uh, uh, we'll ask Sue and Shani to go first. Uh, go ahead and move uh, one or more of the sticky notes um, if you need to or if you want to. You got it. And just let us know when you're more or less done. Okay, uh, great. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, Tracy. Um, first of all, can you go ahead and can you move my the stuff on my screen? Excellent. Looks like you can. All right. So feel free to move any of the uh, of the sticky notes, including the ones that are already grouped. You can move them out of the groups if you if you like to. That's fine. No, again, normally you'd have people kind of doing this all at once, and it doesn't usually lead to a, lead to a fist fight or anything like that. Here we're safe from that, I think, all being virtual <laughs> and all being professional. Um, but uh, go ahead and move any ones that are close that you feel are close in ideas um, to, to each other. And if you're all done, then you can say, I don't need to move any or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think if you click on the center between the plus and the X, you'll be able to do it. There you go. Excellent. I'll leave it there. Okay. All right. And we'll do one more. Uh, Jim? Um, that looks good to me. Okay. Excellent. I just want to show you one other thing that can sometimes happen. It looks, this, by the way, this is great. It look, and, and, and it's a nice place to start. I just want to show you one thing that can sometimes happen. So I, I can tell you at least what my thinking was um, uh, on some of this. Uh, I might have moved this over to here. Now, if if uh, that happens, if you're just getting this going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, uh, or maybe this is over here, uh, back and forth, all you need to do is create another one and put it down, and and, and we can we can end the, uh, the the argument that way. So if we think back and forth meetings uh, is both of these places, that's fine. That's fine. Or if we think poor scheduling belongs in both of those places. That's fine. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So, so one of the next things that we can do is, uh, if we've got it, we should we should separate these. And then there's a lot of talk. At this point, there's a lot of talking between the groups. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to, when you've got them all separated, I'm trying to separate them by, by leaving a little bit of room underneath. There we go. Oh, this is this is actually pretty good. There we go. All right. 
Okay. And um, and we can then we'll want to then put spend some time putting labels on each of these. Put this underneath. So we'll give them all names. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an additional sticky note and I'm going to color it differently. I think I can. Uh, I thought I could color it. No, it looks like I can't. Oh, there it is right there. Okay, so we'll use the blue sticky note. And uh, let's find a name for, like, for example, what might be a name for this one, for this group right here? What might be a name for this group right here? Anybody? Let's try this one. What might be a name for this group? Always late from everything and it's acceptable in the culture. Culture. Might be culture. Might be culture. That's fine. It might be culture. Keep in mind, we've, we've just worked this very quickly. Uh, or like this one might be uh, technical competence. Right? If I don't know how to work my watch, and that happens constantly, or I don't know how to use my Outlook appropriately, and I constantly have poor scheduling, yeah, maybe I'm just not competent to, uh, to uh, make it to meetings on time. Right? Okay. And you can argue with each of, these, uh, each of these different things, but that's the idea is at the end of this, you can, come up to, you can come up with essentially groupings for, in this case, why people come late to meetings. Well, you know, there's, there's the technical side of things. Um, there's the uh, there's the culture. You know, we have a culture of say back-to-back -back meetings uh, anyway, um, and you know, then there's all this 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 uh, we have too many meetings, so we, we have a culture of too many meetings. You know, I, I'm just naming that right now. Normally, you'd want to do it with the team, and so forth. It, it lets you kind of communicate that, and 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 very often let you take like 50 ideas and congeal that into like five or six. Very, very helpful tool. Uh, that's, what, that's how that works. Okay? So far, so good? Makes sense? Aha, Brad is here, and you have the power, too. Okay. Um, all right, so that's how that works. Now, I do want to show you on, um, on page... On page uh, 81 in our text, there's an alternative to using affinity, and that's a fishbone diagram. Uh, fishbone diagrams are, are great for very often for, uh, for defects, if you're trying to understand why defects are, being, are occurring uh, in different areas. Fishbone diagrams are fantastic, uh, but they work essentially like affinity. The difference is in Fishbone, you decide on the categories first, and then brainstorm ideas before putting them up. In Affinity, it's created the other way around. So, you know, Affinity is sometimes helpful if you find that the typical ways of categorizing things are not real conducive to solving the problem. So sometimes, for example, sometimes, for example, it may be more useful to think of a zebra as a as something that is colored black and white rather than as a uh, a, a herbivore. Um, okay, if that makes any sense to you. That one thing uh, is potentially more valuable to another given the, the problem setting. All right, so affinity tends to work a little bit better in those. But fishbone, again, is a, is a wonderful tool. And it works pretty well. I just wanted to point that out. That's in the. Uh, that's certainly in the team tools. Um, so you can certainly pull out a fishbone anytime uh, and use that. And and these are just the standard categories in fishbone. Um, but you can use. And, and by the way, some people use six. Some people use five. I learned them as the five P's. Uh, some people learned them as the five M's. Doesn't matter. Uh, they, obviously, they put different. Uh, if you did the five M's, you learned environment was called Mother Nature. I guess that's maybe a little sexist, but anyway. Uh, and procedures were methods. So anyway, 
Um, you can brainstorm your own uh, prior to doing the, uh, the, the session, too. So that's another idea. All right, I want to finish up with doing something called multi-voting. Now, one of the things, if we go back to our, if we go back to our, our desktop here, one of the things we haven't done yet, we might have a good idea of where we want to, uh, of, of the picture now, but we don't have a good priority in terms of looking into these ideas. I mean, if we really think that we want to fix this meeting problem, where should we drill down? Should we drill down into the, 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 um, uh, the multiple schedule? I guess I better put a name on all these. Or should we drill down uh, in other places, like, hey, we have back-to-back -back meetings and so forth? All right. So, um, so one of the tools that you can do use to do that is a tool that is on 84, and it starts on 83. There's an explanation for it. But the picture, I think, uh, tells a thousand words in this case. It's called multi-voting. And if you can imagine, suppose I gave you all three votes, and you could cast your votes on any uh, of the sticky notes. Um, and you could cast all of the three on one of them if you wanted to, or you could cast, uh, or you could spread them out. Okay? So you could use colored markers to do this, or you could have a silent vote. Uh, either way. Uh, but just imagine that that's what you were doing. So um, in our picture on the desktop, it would be something like uh, something like this, you know. If if I gave people different colors, and uh, you got three votes, I might vote on. Well, this is what I think is my important, and I, I'm going to cast all three votes there. Um, and uh, you know, Sue, uh, where would you cast your votes, Sue? Where might you cast your votes? You can just use an example. Where might I cast my vote? I would actually agree with you with back-to-back um, -back meetings. Okay, and you put all three there? Um, I would put, actually I put one there, too many meetings, and then... Um, okay, so just, just one over on this guy. Uh huh. And then the culture. And then culture. It's acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, got it. So now notice there's a couple of things here. One is you can go directly for the area or you can go for a sticky note within the area. In the end, you just kind of want to step back and you want to see where all the dots are. And so not to make up uh, answers for everybody, but uh, that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> so, you know, maybe for, for, for uh, Jim... <laughs> Uh, maybe it's his cell phone went dead. Maybe that's a big one for him. But um, you know, maybe it's a, hey, it's acceptable in the culture that we're living at, and and an inability to say no. Uh, we have an inability to say no. Uh, somebody else might say there's high priority, whatever. In the end, uh, we ought to get a smattering of these things, and we can see what are the areas that we want to drill down on. So if we ended up with a picture that was like this. This would give us an idea that, hey, let's look into why we have all these scheduled back-to-back -back meetings. That's a huge problem for us. Okay? So that's how this works. That's how multi-voting works. It just is a, a quick and dirty prioritization mechanism. Um, that's helpful when you have these sticky notes. Okay? And that's a BAM session. That, that when you put it all together, um, that's your BAM session. That's your BAM session. Brainstorm, affinity, multi-vote, and you can move very quickly. Usually, in uh, say an hour, you can get a clear picture on um, on a uh, on how to move on a on how to fix defects or what customers or ideas ought to have priority. Uh, what CTQ, what uh, uh, voice of the customer elements are most important. Uh, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool or set of tools. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to move on. Uh, what questions do you have on what we've covered so far, which is brainstorming, affinity, and multi-voting? Okay. Um, I, I would uh, also like it. I, I'm going to check my mute button to make sure people aren't muted. Uh, looks like everybody's unmuted. 
uh, if you've used this before, uh, if anybody has any experiences of sharing uh, these tools in, in conjunction or alone, uh, I'd be happy to, to hear them. I think it'd be valuable for the group. Um, Mark, we've used that a number of times, and what um, I find that I like about it is that it helps people to prioritize Mm -hmm. um, and if you do it where it's silently, people aren't being influenced necessarily by, by management or by someone else. And so you get to really see where people feel the real issues are or where they feel the real solutions are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, we used it in the uh, front end quoting, if you recall. Mm -hmm. We did. Where yep, we, we used it multiple times in our pharmacy authorization. One, we find that on this particular project, silence. They're, they're very, they are very quiet. They are driving us crazy. But um, so we, you know, this worked particularly well uh -huh. with them. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Any other uh, experiences? Okay. Hey, Mark, well, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. <laughs> Is this John? Um, no, this is Brad. I'm trying out my... Uh... I can hear you. Yes, you sound uh, very close. Are you in my backyard? <laughs> That's your VOIP, I take it. Well, maybe we lost you. Okay, well, if you, come, if you do come back, uh, be more than willing to, to, to listen to it. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on at this point, but... There's two other there's two other uh, uh, tools that are in the uh, that are in the section. I just want to show you what they are. And um, and uh, we'll have a very short um, whoops uh, lecture on on those. Um, but if you haven't seen them before, I just want to mention it. The first one is YY analysis, which is one of those tools to go very, very deep. So um, the idea is you take whatever the effect is. Like suppose we said, um, okay, yeah, why, why are people late to meetings? Because there's multiple reasons, right? But we want to choose the ones that we want to drill down in deeply. One of those was back-to-back -back meetings. We asked the next question, well, why do people have back-to-back -back meetings? There can be multiple reasons for that and so forth. The idea is to use typically about five, although sometimes you can get to the bottom with, uh, with, uh, of a problem with like three or four, typically about five whys. We'll get you to things that are real endpoints, and, and you'll get to the point where you say, well, why is that true? Well, it's because Mother Nature is that way, or because if you're religious, it's because God made it that way, or if you're a... Um, uh, a naturalist or whatever you'll say because mother nature was made that way anyway um, so so uh, an example and the one that everybody usually uses no doubt apocryphal is the one about the Lincoln Memorial and the steps on there that we're wearing and uh, the linear fashion is why were the Lincoln Memorial steps wearing out so fast um, because because they're being cleaned a lot why were they being cleaned a lot? Because there was pigeon poop all over them. Why was there pigeon poop? Because the pigeons came to eat the, the spiders that were living there. Why were the spiders living there? Because there were midges that were coming from the reflecting pool. Why were the midges coming from the reflecting pool? Because they were attracted to the lights on at dusk. Why were the lights on at dusk? Because we did it. Because we turned them on at dusk. Why do we turn them on at dusk? Because we do. Why do we do it? Because that's the rule. Why is that the rule? Because we said it is. So you see, at some point it becomes ridiculous. And you can start going back to say, well, maybe we ought to stop at uh, because that's the rule. And maybe we can do something actionable. The key is to say at, at each place, can we do something actionable about this? And can we ask one more why? It's important to do both of those because let's take the, the example when you say, well, why are... Why, are, why is there so much pigeon poop on the steps? It's because pigeons come there to eat the spiders. You might say, well, okay, I have a solution. Let's just get out guns and shoot the pigeons. That might be a major problem on the Washington Mall. Um, so um, 
you know, that's a very, and it's a much more costly solution than maybe altering by 10 minutes when you turn on the lights. Um, so anyway, so it, it's worth it to ask. The danger with this and with a lot of these tools is the multiple whys. So uh, there's lots of different answers that could have been given to any of those. And so make sure you do your best to kind of uh, drill the ones that are important and not drill the ones that aren't that important. Okay. Uh, here's an example of, uh, you'll notice in the, in the book we talked through an example of kids on vacation. Uh, I'll tell you that was in my brain as I was doing this. Why do we have a poor vacation? It was because the kids were unhappy. There's lots of other reasons, but that's the primary one I want to drill into. Why? Because they were tired, frustrated, and bored. Why were they frustrated? Uh, why were they bored? Well, we took them to the Museum of Medieval Farming. Uh, okay, that seems like, why did we do that? You know, why was that boring? Well, because it is, uh, and so forth. And you can come down to all this, and, you know, basically the, the solution here is that dad is inherently uncool and boring, and maybe mom ought to make the uh, decisions uh, for what, what the kids are supposed to be doing. Um, at least that's how it was in our in our uh, group. Um, finally, I want to talk about something called an ID graph or a spider diagram. And um, this is another way, if you're having trouble understanding sort of, uh, if you have multiple potential causes or problems, um, it's sometimes helpful for understanding what's causing what. Let me show you what that what it is. If uh, say we have five different um, five different potential problems or or things like the kids un are unhappy, uh, we have to we have to spend a lot. There's a high cost uh, and things like that. We draw a picture and we we start with each box and we draw arrows each for whether it's driving um, uh, whether that particular problem is driving uh, the other particular problem. So for example, if if Whoops! If kids were driving cost, then that, then kids would be a driver of that. But if co but but uh, but not the other way around, right? So you you try with each of these. At the end, you'll count the hours, uh, uh, the arrows coming in, the arrows coming out, and it lets you know sort of what's driving what. An example I think will will clear up a lot of this stuff. So here might be all the different issues that we had: transportation, kids' activities, interest and friends and cost. Um, and we would start with, say, uh, let's start with, um, well, let's do kids' activities, right? So um, you might say, is kid, is, is the, are the kids' activities driving the issues with transportation? Yes? Okay, so it gets an arrow going out. Um, are kids' activities driving cost? Yes? Okay, so it gets an arrow going out. Are kids' activities driving friends? Yes? Because we wouldn't go to these particular friends if we didn't have kids, because they have kids. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's driving that. And it's driving, yes, it's driving interest, too. So we want to go to some places, but kids won't be interested, so we'll go to some other place. And if you do that with all the boxes, you can count the ins and count the outs, and it will allow you to see which are drivers and which are, which are sort of more results. So in this case, for example, cost is not driving too many things, but it's a it's got some boxes coming in, so it's a result of, whoops, of, for example, kids' activities are driving cost as well as transportation driving cost. But kids' activities is a real driver here. So it allows you to, it's another prioritization tool, um, if you will. So sometimes it's helpful to know of all the different problems, how they're interrelated. Interrelationship diagram can help you understand that. Or spider diagram, sometimes people call it. Okay? So, so basically, um, so basically, um, we've covered all the tools in there. I won't claim that we've covered them to their depths. I want you to really take away this idea of the BAM session, um, and also, um, uh, yeah, of taking away the, the idea of a BAM session, brainstorm, affinity, multi-voting, awesome, awesome tool, or awesome set of tools. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and move on from this, but before I do, I want to make sure that we have questions or that all the questions are answered. So uh, let me kind of go back to uh, go back to my blackboard and go back to here. And remember, we covered the team tools, which um, 
We had some diverging tools. The main one we talked about was brainstorming, get lots of ideas, quantity, not quality. Affinity, which helps us group those ideas. Fishbone does the same thing, so it's alternative. And then we use multi-voting to help prioritize. And then there were a couple of different tools that really helped us go deep. ID graph and the five whys. Okay, so what questions do you have before we move into uh, a different topic? Uh, hey Mark, it's Jim. Uh, hey Jim. What are some of the the little tricks that you've learned to uh, avoid putting some of your team members and your subject matter experts on the defensive? You know, for example, you might have somebody who has multiple years of experience with a particular process, and uh, he just feels real defensive about the reasons why he continues to do what he does. Yeah. Um, well, there's a few different things. Uh, there's a few different things that you can try. One is to do, uh, uh, one is to have on anonymity if there are problems that are a little bit different than what you talked about. I'm not getting participation because, um, because uh, my boss is in the room, or because I'm just shy by nature. Um, uh, and round and, and round robins and prompting people for participation is helpful too. You'll notice I was doing that as we were doing the round robins. I eventually stopped because I noticed that people weren't on, uh, or some people weren't on during that time. Um, but that can be helpful too. You don't want to push it too much, but um, um, like you'll notice that I did that with Shani just a little bit. Uh, Shani can take it. I know. I know that uh, she's no shrinking violet. But but um, when she said I don't have any, any any more ideas or my the ideas that I had, I I said, oh, do you have any other ones that you'd like to share? So, so some of those things can be helpful. Um, working really hard to keep it light is very important. So if you can come up with a crazy analogy to start out and maybe encourage other people to come up with crazy analogies, um, sometimes that's helpful. Because it's kind of like, um, I don't know if you guys are fans of the Twilight Zone. I happen to be a fan of, of, of Rod Serling and the Twilight Zone. Um, and, but you know, he wrote something before that called Playhouse 90. He wrote a lot of those things, which was very high quality television that was done. The problem was it was very expensive. But he was very into talking about the political and the social issues of the day. The problem was he was getting censored. So he found a way around the censors by saying, oh, well, well what if aliens, what if we put people and aliens doing these things so that it was unreal? then we could make statements about what it would be like to live in a totalitarian society or uh, we could explore lots of things. Um, uh, you know, the Planet of the Apes is a great example of that, you know. Um, or certainly, um, I think it's called Eye of the Beholder when, um, when this, this lady is given plastic surgery and she comes back and she looks beautiful to us, but then it fades back and everybody has these pig-like faces. Um, um, he could do that because he was talking about aliens. So, so, not that you have to talk about aliens all the time, but having some crazy things that, that are unrelated to work sometimes helps. Um, That's excellent. I really like that. Okay. Yeah, good. And, and you know, in fact, sometimes the other way uh, doesn't work either. Um, I remember once doing a, um, a simulation at a healthcare, uh, a small dental um, healthcare uh, uh, facility, and we did a processing simulation of uh, demonstrating lean that actually was their own process. They got so into it that people started, there were two people that actually got uh, in, into a screaming match. I wasn't watching closely enough, and uh, they were upset at each other. <laughs> so it got more real than it, I, and I had to w walk, t t talk to them and say, look, guys, this is a simulation. It doesn't really matter, okay? Let's um, pretend this is wi widgets. Okay, great question, great question. Okay, what other questions do you have? Okay, um, uh, for for the sake of argument, uh, I'm going to go on, and not for the sake of argument, for the sake of time, I'm going to go on, and uh, I'd like to cover very, very, very briefly something called the central limit theorem, and. Um, and 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 uh, and hypothesis testing. Now, central limit theorem makes it is a theorem that comes in statistics 
The reason why you're going to say, oh, well, how do I use this? Well, you sort of use it all the time. If you're a black belt, you definitely need to know where a lot of these, why the hypothesis test, why the hypothesis tests and confidence intervals work. Um, and um, uh, let's see. Um, so, and I also want to, uh, so this leads us to hypothesis tests, confidence intervals. And I want to go over a couple of those just to make sure that we get them for some, some good settings. Like I said, you'll be able to, I'll post a video hopefully over the weekend that does all of that section. Um, but I want to cover a little bit of it. Now, as a backdrop of that, what we're really trying to do with, st with statistical analyses, and this may be, there's a reason why I asked you in that last part to talk about what new ideas were presented in that section on introduction to hypothesis testing. And um, I guess in the, in, here, here's kind of the, the way that we see life is very often, we constantly have this struggle, and you saw it in affinity and brainstorming, between just another instance, and let's record the facts, and seeing patterns. We're born to see patterns. We like doing that. That's what learning is all about, right? The problem is we often see more patterns that are actually evident there. So hypothesis testing and confidence intervals formulate a check that bridges the gap between making a statement about single data points, right, which is the pockmarks right here, to the whole population. What we really want to do in business is not to say, ah, for this particular data set, this manager performed better than the other one, because we're just hemming and hawing and saying, well, next week all bets could be off and it could be the opposite. So, you know, all I'm doing is stating the facts. Well, that's great, we, but, but what we want to do in business is we want to make changes so that we can institute uh, processes that are different. We want to make changes that will work for all of the future data that we're going to collect, right? So we want to be able to generalize to a population from a sample. So on the left-hand side, we've got sample. On the right-hand side, oh no, sample. On the right-hand side, we've got the population. Now I'm going to write this out. On the left-hand side, we have a bunch of X's x1, x2, x3, so forth. Okay, that's what these dots are. On the right-hand side, we have all of the population. I'll call it capital N. Okay, now watch very closely the notation. On the left-hand side, we have what we normally would call the mean. Everybody talks about the mean. This is what they mean by the word mean, the average, right? But I'm going to call this a very different thing. I'm going to call this the sample average. I'll just write down average because it's short. But I call this the sample average. It's, am, it's, the, it's the average of a sample of data that I have. In the general population, I envision that somewhere out there, I'll never actually know it exactly, but somewhere out there is a, a real population mean. I can estimate it by calculating the average. This is the population mean. And this is the sample mean, right? So that's the mean. Okay. Then we've got the standard deviation. Okay. The standard deviation in the sample, I can calculate it by S. And in my population, it is sigma. That's the standard deviation. Get rid of some of this other stuff that's on the side just because it's bollocksing it up. Screwing it up. I had a friend who was British when I was in high school, highly influenced by him. Um, in the sample, I might care about the median. I'm going to write that down as X50 for the 50th percentile. That's A lot of people write it as different notation. They might write down X tilde. That's what I learned in statistics school. That's, that's X with a squiggle on it. I think X50 is more explicit, and so I get it. And I'll write down the Greek letter nu. That's N-U, nu, nu, nu. Nothing new there um, for that. So that's what we use for the median. And finally, for a proportion or a percentage, you can think of a percentage as well, but I'm going to call this proportion. I'm looking for in the population I'm talking about pi. Okay, so you'll notice that we've got Greek over here and English over here. Okay, got it? So when we're talking about, we only really see this 
but we're going to generalize to this. The thing that helps us generalize is something called a hypothesis test. All right? So hypothesis tests work, and that's all we're really trying to do. We see when we make a plot, we see something over here. Let's make a calculation to back up that what we see is real for the population or we're able to generalize there. And that's the only reason we do this. Okay, so that's why hypothesis test basically does. Okay, now the way that it does it, and they all work the same. Oh, oh by the way, for our intents and purposes, these are the things that we're really going to care about. Only four, and of these, really only three are of high priority. This is the highest priority. These are the ones that we usually test. X bar. I wonder if my sample means are the same or are they really different in the population. Okay, that's the big star. The other ones that get maybe a little star are, boy, I can't even do that, are, propor are proportions. Okay. I wonder if the proportion or the percent here is the same as the percent there and standard deviations. Okay, medians, although, although Lean Six Sigma people talk about testing medians all the time, we're going to find that because of something called the central limit theorem, medians, uh, first of all, they, the, the tests tend to be not very powerful and they, always, and they, never, they, they very rarely help you. <laughs> But uh, worse, um, or not worse, um, what we can usually say about, a lot of people say, well, we can't use means because of normal distributions. We're going to find that from the central limit theorem, uh, most uh, population means, no matter what the underlying distribution is, end up being normal anyway, and so they don't violate, or end up being close to normal, so they don't violate our, prob our, our things that we've, the things that we've thought. Okay, so um, uh, so those are the three that I want to do, and I'll show you how they work basically um, by doing a, an example or two in the book, and that's kind of what we're going to be doing uh, for the rest here. First, the central limit theorem, and the central limit theorem just gives justification. The CLT uh, just gives justification for using. Our, our hypothesis test confidence intervals. Okay, that's it. So let's take a look at what that is. And by the way, this is in the book. Uh, this is certainly in our in our book. But um, I, I want to show you this how it works in um, in practice. You'll notice that this actually is in our tools in sampling. So you can do this too. All right. So um, one of the things that we should note here is that what, what the central limit theorem states, or what it says, is the following. Not the sticky notes, no. What the central limit theorem states is the following. That if I have from a from any sort of if I'm taking any sort of data on these these little dots right my X's my X's if my X's are any sort of distribution I'll write that as any distribution any shape with some mean unknown and some standard deviation also unknown we don't know these that the average, if we repeatedly average these, if we sampled, say, 10, and then averaged that, and then sampled another 10, and averaged that, that the average, x bar, would have a normal distribution with a mean of the same. If this were 2, this would also be 2, and a standard deviation of the original standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, now you might not think that's important, but we all have an intuitive idea that that works. If we average, say, nine different, uh, 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 if, we, if we take an average of nine numbers, that's better than just taking an average of two. And if we take an average of 100, that's better than if we take an average of nine. That's because the distribution here is shrinking. It's getting a, a tightened distribution over here. Let me show you how that works, okay? I'm just going to. It's an amazing theorem. 
I get really excited for stuff like this. Which maybe goes to show you I got too much geek. But um, let me just show you how this works. So, so uh, the idea is, suppose we had a population. In this case, the population is represented by a thousand. And we're just going to take a sample. In this case, a size 10. Let me make it of size 9 because we know the square root there, right? The square root of 9 is 3. So if this is our population, and the population is normal, um, uh, here, but every time we sample 9 from it, we get a different sort of look. So sometimes that doesn't even look very normal. We take another, that doesn't look very normal. That looks a little bit normal, but these are just samples of size 9 from this population. Okay? So not all of them look normal. My claim is that, that if I take averages and I take a sample of size 9 and do that over and over and over again, that the, the distribution of those averages will also have a mean of 5 and its standard deviation will be uh, 1.12, which is about 1.2, right? Divided by the square root of, three, of 9, which is 3. So 1.2 divided by 3 is about 0.4. So let's see if that's actually true. To see if that's actually true, I can go to the distribution of means and just start sampling. Okay, instead of 9, let me do 16. A little bit bigger, so now it's, it should be divided by 3. So this is my postulated distribution. I say whatever the underlying distribution is, I'll have my distribution of x bar, or of the means, will be a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 0.3, which is 1.2 divided by the square root of, of 16, which is 4. Okay, so if I take a sample, and I'm going to show the normal curve on this. Well, my first one was off. My second one was off. But look at what happens when I repeatedly do this. I'm going to let it rip. And there it is. Let me pause it now. Now, I've taken a lot of samples. I've taken 140 samples, but check it out. It certainly not only looks normal, but it's exactly the normal that we thought we were going to get. We thought we were going to get a normal of 5 and 0.3. Look how close we got to that. It, was a no it certainly looks like a normal shape. 5 and 0.27, that's pretty close. Among friends, that's 0.3. So, uh, so it works. Now, you might be asking, well, we started with a normal distribution, so shouldn't the mean look like a normal distribution? The cool thing is, this works for any shape. So it works, for example, if I have a uniform distribution. Check it out. Look, if I'm, if I'm sampling, let me sample, uh, say, 16 times from that. If I sample, these distributions over here certainly don't look normal. No way. But if I look at their means, if I take one, no, two, no, but check it out. Now check that out. Look at that. That certainly is normal. And not only is it normal, it's the specific normal that we thought we were going to get, which was the original distribution divided by the square root of 16, which is 4. That's what we thought we were going to get. And we actually got this when we sampled 139 times. OK, so now this is not a proof by any means. And, and by the way, it works for anything. So we can even take skewed distributions. Of, you, know, you might say, well, I bet that can't possibly be a normal. Yes, the distribution of means turns out to be normal, and it turns out to have those same characteristics. Let's pause it and see how close we got. Does that look like a normal distribution? Sure does to me. How about this guy? Yep, it looks about the same as what we predicted. There was the mean. There was a standard deviation, so we divide by that by 4, and... Uh, that's what we expected to get. Oh, I'm sorry, that's what we expected to get, and we got this. So again, pretty close. So the theory works. I didn't prove it mathematically, but I I, hopefully I demonstrated it for you. Um, in your next assignment, you'll be asked to kind of walk through that, if you're, if you're a, a black belt, not if you're a green belt, uh, to, to walk through that and kind of get an idea of, uh, of how it all works. Okay? All right, so that just kind of gives justification for that. And um, so what I wanted to do now was to kind of end today 
by talking a little bit about uh, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals and set the stage for you to be able to watch that particular um, that particular video which I'll post um, and just kind of see all see how it all works so I wanted to show you in um, I'm going to also crank up Minitab, and we can do this in, 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 um, in Minitab. And, and Excel stats, I'll do uh, in both for the first couple. And we'll cover the important things, and the important things only. So hypothesis testing, which, by the way, starts on slide. So the stuff that I'm covering right now is the stuff that starts on slide whoops, where did I go, uh, on this slide right here, which is 109, okay? So 109 in your book is really what we're talking about right now, okay? And uh, for that, oops, for that in hypothesis testing, like I said, we're going to look at four different types, and one is more important than the others. Hypothesis testing, we're going to learn four different cases. Okay, the first one is, are the means the, are, are the, means the same? So we're going to have test, test for, for x bar slash mu. Okay, that's means. So we can, you can ask the question, are two population means the same or are they different? We can ask a question about S or the standard deviation. Notice I'm writing the sample and the Greek one, which is the population. Are standard deviations the same if variation is an issue? We can ask the question, are medians the same? But that's a rare one. I'm going to leave that to the end, X50 uh, or new. In fact, I won't even cover it today. And finally, we can ask about proportions, p or pi. Are the proportions the same? Like I said, this is rare. You'll rarely need this. This is very common. This is common. And this is, I'll just put moderate here. Okay, it's not as rare, certainly not as rare as, as the median test, but it's not used as often. Okay, what is the test? What are the tests that we're going to use? Here, these are t-tests. Here, we're going to talk about the f-test or Levine's test. And here, we're going to talk about the two proportions test. Nice. T, why did they, why did they call this the T-test? Uh, well, I know why, but it's not a very illuminating, illuminating answer. Uh, the F-test and Levine's. Um, I like the two proportions test. It just test says what it is. We're testing two proportions. That's what the name of the test is. Over here, there are many, many, many that are here, and everybody's coming up with different ones later. One of them is the Kruskal-Wallis, and that's as good as any. Okay, another one is called Moods Median. A lot of people are proponents of that. Another one is called the Man Whitney. These are all great statisticians. <laughs> Mood, Kruskal, Wallace, Man, and Whitney. I actually did some studying under, under Ransom Whitney. Uh, he was at Ohio State. Okay. What is his lifestyles of the relatives of the rich and famous or something? Okay, uh, okay. So uh, let's let's take some time to see how hypothesis tests work for uh, all of these. And once you learn one, you'll see that basically they're all the same. They're all the same. They all work the same. You just have to choose which question you're interested in, and you choose that from looking at a plot. If you look at a plot and you see things that, that maybe the variation looks different, you might say, huh, maybe I would test the, the standard deviations are the same or not. 
if you see maybe the means look different, you say, hmm, maybe I'm going to test to see if the means are different, and so forth. So that which thing comes from the from the uh, from the context of the problem of, of your data. All right. So here's the framework. And you'll see this again in that uh, I think if you're if you're watching and following um, the framework is given. It was given in the one that I had you read last week, but it's repeated, for example, on slide 119. Um, but it was in the last section uh, of the last week in the assignment there. So here's the uh, hypothesis test framework. What we do is we take um, one thing that we assume, first of all, think innocent until proven guilty. Okay, so that's that's the thinking that we want to have in hypothesis testing. And the one of innocent, in other words, this is one of the things that's different about hypothesis testing and about statistical thinking is um, we think the opposite of the way that we normally think. One of the, our major cognitive biases that we suffer from is called uh, confirmation bias. That is, we formulate theories, and then we look for things that support that theory. In, in, in hypothesis testing, you're going to say, no, hold it. Let me first start out by saying, I assume that my theory is wrong, that there's nothing right about it, and I have to supply evidence that, that, disproves, that disproves that there's nothing going on. So um, basically, the, you, you break something up into into two groups, two possible states of nature. One is the null hypothesis. This is called the null, and this is called its alternative. And we and, and the null always means basically there's nothing is happening or nothing's going on. And this is usually our hopes slash wishes slash dreams, whatever. This is our theory. This is our theory. Okay? And what it tactically looks like is the following. Let me just write it one more time. It's going to look the same all the time. For means, it looks like this. Let's say we had two groups. Let me call them, uh, let, let's say men and women. Okay? Uh, M and F, I'll label them. For means, my null might be that the mean for the men is equal to the mean for the women versus my alternative, the mean for the men is not equal to the mean for the women. Wow. <laughs> and, and guess what it's going to be for standard deviations? Think about it for a second and guess what it might look like. Okay, time's up. I bet you guessed right. My null is going to say, I wonder if the standard deviation, now I switch the order of M and F here, if the means for females are the same versus they are not the same. Okay? That's it. And when we run our hypothesis, and so everything is going to look like this when we write it down. That's a math statement. And, uh, we're, what we're going to use to decide is something called a p-value. Okay? And in each one of these cases, if p-value is less than 0 0.05, then we reject H0. Okay? That's the rule. Now, 0 0.05, we'll talk about that later. That's an arbitrary number, but it essentially represents 1 in 20 chance of making the mistake that, uh, that you're seeing a ghost, of concluding that there really is something there when there isn't. 1 in 5. That's the standard. In medical tests, a lot of times uh, uh, they want to do much, much more than that. So in drug testing, p-values they look at to, to be conclusive are much lower than that. But in ordinary operations, that's about it. O5 is, is what the standard is usually for a study. Okay. So that's it. 
And so um, we use the phrase, if P is low, the null must go. Some people use, if P is low, HO must go. Be careful with that one, all right? All right. Just saying. Okay, let's see how this all works out, all right? So that's the theory. That's it. There's no more theory. Having said all this, I'm trying to put it into your brain right now. You'll probably want to watch this over and over again if this is the first time you've seen it because it is hard to get. <laughs> Once you get it, you'll never forget it, and it'll be just very straightforward. And you'll do it as a matter of course, as a matter of uh, it's like it's like riding a bicycle. I almost said it's like falling off a bicycle. <laughs> Maybe it is. All right, let's let's do an example or two. And uh, the example that I'll start out with is um, um, yeah, let's start out with the backlogs before and after. Remember that one. And we'll just do a couple of these. And, boy, I didn't realize what a pain these were going to be. <laughs> Get rid of all the sticky notes. Probably can do it uh, more easily. But, okay. Let's start out with the backlogs before and after. I'm going to do this one in uh, Excel Stats, but we'll do the next one in Minitab. Okay, so the first thing that we'll do is we'll uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll draw the box. When in doubt, draw the box. Right? Okay. Okay. Now let me get rid of all our box marks there. Okay. So I'm going to draw the box, and here I've got a whoa. White is no good. Uh, here I've got uh, my backlogs. And here I've got, well, it's before versus after. After I made my process change. So remember, this was a healthcare company that was trying to reduce the backlog of pended claims. Work in progress. This is a num. This is a cat. Okay. And here's our PGA. Okay, so let's start here. I wonder if my change has worked. I'm going to make a graph of it, and I'm going to use a graph to motivate the test. Graph motivates hypothesis test. Okay, so let's do that. Let's make the graph first. Here's my one num, one cat. Okay, now we can use lots of different, lots of different charts. Um, I'm going to try and get you to start using something called a box plot because there, the box plots are great when you have like many more, uh, many more, um, many more groups than just two. And there's two different rules, and this is given in one of the sections. I think it was in the, the first section we did last week, week three, the data analysis examples. The first rule is a test of means. And so I call it the UFO test. I look at this and I say, okay, notice that here's our backlog volume. So this is my Y and this is my time period. This is my X, right? And I say, I wonder if, I, I look at this plot and I say, I, tr I pretend that these are UFOs. And if I see one hovering above the other, like you see how this one looks like it's hovering way above the other, I might say, ah, means look different. Okay, so that's the first test. And the second test, in this case, for example, they really do look different. So we'll test that. And in the second one, I'll use the birthday present. Test. And this is for variances or for standard deviations. And I'll ask the question, Ah, if one of these boxes, the forget, you know how it is with your birthday, you just look at the box, you just look at the present, don't worry about the ribbons and all that stuff, the packaging around it, just look at the ribbons. 
So I'm going to look at the size of the box, and if I see the size of the box for one looks bigger than the other, then maybe the standard deviations are different. Okay? So for this one, um, again, I might go, are the sigmas different? Okay. For this one, it looks like I'm going to go with the means. Doesn't that look like that to you? Looks like the means are different, but the sigmas, eh, maybe not that much of a difference. So, let's go ahead and write down our hypothesis test for that. I'm just going to write it right on the page here. My hypothesis test is first for the, the nulls, means the same, versus HA means different. I'm going to be more explicit here in just a moment. That doesn't mean I'm going to start swearing. Okay. Before is equal to mean after versus mean before is not equal to mean after. Okay, got it? And I'm going to decide which one of these is true. I'm going to essentially assume that HO is true. And if my p-value is very, very low, my advisor is going to roll in his grave when I say this, but it's kind of like the p-value is the probability that the null is true. Okay, it's kind of like that. Um, and it's okay to think that way, contrary to what other statisticians will tell you. It's okay to think that way. All right, um, even though it's strictly speaking not quite true. All right, um, another way of writing this would be, and you'll see that Minitab and Excel stats both do it this way, HO mu B minus mu A equals zero versus the alternative of mu B minus mu A is not equal to zero. They're both the same thing. These two, these two statements are both the same. All right, so that's our test. So we're going to crank this through, find a p-value, and, and see what it is. If it's lower than 0.05, we'll cross that off. Okay, so let's go and do that. Well, how do we do that in Excel stats? Easy peasy. Okay. I told you that this one actually gives us an idea when we look at the if it's overlapping or not. That essentially is going to tell us, yeah, we're going to reject the null. But let's just do the whole p-value thing. To do that, we can mosey on over to the test by two categories and just see what they're comparing. Okay, I'm comparing before and after. Okay, there's my mean before. Uh, oh, there it is. Look at that. There's my hypothesis test. And it says mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero versus not equal to zero, and there's my p-value. There's that tiny, tiny value. Remember I did the scientific notation last time? That's 2.99 that's, that's with 25 zeros in front of it. So that is very, very small, certainly much less than 0 0.05, right? So that's it. Uh, let, me, let me color this so we can see it. So in this case is P less than 0.05? Yes. Therefore, we reject the null, we reject the null, we reject the null, and we reject it in favor of the alternative. Therefore, we have concluded that the means are statistically different, and that and 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 and, and that's it. So we have verified in our PGA cycle that the means are different. Okay, that's it. So we've just gone one step further to say, can we really believe what we see in the plot? That's it. That's all a hypothesis test is. All right? Okay. Let's do uh, another, let's do this example in, in Minitab, just so you see how it works in Minitab. Get the thing in Minitab. Now, the difference in Minitab is you need to know that this is called a two-sample t-test. We talk about this in the book, and I also put that on our uh, on the whiteboard. I'm sorry, the blackboard. I also put that on our blackboard that here it is right there. They're, they're t-tests. Right, and I've got two samples here. I've got one sample for men, one sam or before, one sample for after. Um, so those are the two samples. So it's a two-sample t-test. 
Okay. Now let's get back here. But here's how to do it in, in mini tab. We'll go up to stat, basic statistics, two sample T. There we go. And now it says, do I have them in one column? Do I have different columns? Now the nice thing about mini tab is it's very flexible. So here's my sample, backlog, and the subscripts are time period. And I can make I can make box plots too. There's my box plots. Before and after. Yep. So mini tab can do box plots too. And there's my P value. P is low, so the null must go. P is low, so HO must go. And that's it. Now, if you've got a, an eagle eye, you're also seeing a confidence interval. And a confidence interval is like, it tells you, it gives you an idea of exactly um, what those differences are. So, uh, remember uh, earlier I said, said that uh, hypothesis tests are great for telling you what isn't true. What we know isn't true is the null. It's not true. But confidence intervals are good for telling you what is true. The next question is, oh, so it's not true that the, the averages were the, the same. So what is the difference between the average? Confidence interval tells you, well, it's somewhere between 34 and 41. Okay? So that's that. That's how that works in Minitab. I want to give you one more example. And this one is, uh, is not in the book, but we can do it very quickly. This one is from, uh, you also have this, so you can, it's called software usage. So we're doing something from a, uh, a uh, file called software usage. So here, in this case, we've got, let me draw this. Let me draw the box as usual. Uh -huh. And we'll erase this. Okay, so here we've got, um, oh, I need to go to black. Okay, I've got count new software. I'll call that CNS. Here we've got a, a situation where a department installed new software and people weren't using it, so they wanted to find out why. And so they looked into a number of different things. But anyway, that's a number. And then they looked into the type of paper that they were using, uh, how much support that people were getting, uh, were they trained in the old software, uh, was it the, what shift it was, trained um, support paper and department okay so that's a num these te these these tech these specific techniques don't lend themselves too well to num num we'll cover that when we do regression which is next week support that is a cat Train, that's a cat. Shift, that's a cat. Department, that's a cat. So uh, for all of these, we may have some questions, some hypothesis tests that we have when we do the PGA. Okay, practical, graphical, analytical. All right, so let's take a look at how we might handle that or how we might proceed through that uh, by, doing X, by using Excel stats. Now, the nice thing about Excel stats is you can do it all kind of uh, quickly and at once. Put the count of the new software over there. And let's see if shift makes a difference. So uh, if we look at it pretty quickly, let's take a look at the plots to see if they're different or the same. Well, I'm not seeing very much. Let's take a look at the box plot because I said that we ought to we ought to look at it. Let's do our UFO test. Doesn't look to me like there's any hovering. Like this doesn't look higher than this. They look kind of in line with each other. So I might not test means. The box is different. I might not test that either. So, um, you know, there's not much of a difference. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do the test right here just to show you what happens when you do and the p-value doesn't get, does, may not turn out to be low. Let's check it out. So if we do the test on two categories, day versus evening shift, there it is. There's my p-value, 0.857. So, in fact, the null is not low. I'm sorry, the P is not low, so the null, in this case, does not go. All right, so let me take a look at that. Let's take a, just a quick look at that. So the way we write our hypothesis is H0, 
mean for shift one, I'll call it S1, is equal to mean of S2, and HA mean of S1 is not equal to mean of S2. All right, now we have to be a little bit careful with our language here, but P is not low, so we don't reject the null. <laughs> we cannot let HO go. All right. Uh, if, some people say if P is high, HA is your guy, or HO is your guy. I don't know if I like that one, but um, anyway, you can try that out if you want. Um, but notice that I'm not saying that we, that we know that the null is true. We just assume that it is true, but we're not trying to prove that it is. We're, trying to, we're not trying to prove a negative here. Um, but, but functionally speaking, you're saying, in my project, I'm going to treat the null as if it's true, and the shift, it doesn't matter which shift it is. So let's cross that out, not important value, variable. Okay, you see what we just did there? Okay. Now, we could have done that directly from the plot, but I decided in doing a hypothesis test anyway. The other thing that's interesting is, now, oh, now I'm going to erase it there, um, is that the is that the lower and the upper, the confidence interval, crosses zero, which shows that uh, zero is a reasonable number for my estimate of the difference, which shows that they're basically the same. If I can say that zero is a good estimate for what their difference is, there's not much of a difference. Okay. Let's do, let's do one more, and then we will uh, stop for sure. Let's, instead of doing uh, the shift, let's do were they trained in the old software or not. So that was a question that came up to this. Somebody said, well, maybe if they were trained, in the, if they were trained on the on software, they'd be able to get it quicker, and so they'll be using the new software more. Let's see if that's true. Well, we all know that the first thing we do is make a plot. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So let's take a look at this. Here, when we use our UFO test, it sure looks to me like this is hovering a little bit above this guy. See, this is taking off, and this is still sitting on the ground. See how that's a little bit higher? The box sizes look about the same, right? The size of the box looks about the same. But this one looks a little bit like it's taken off, off the cornfield. So I might want to see if the means are different. Remember, the UFO test is for the means. So let's go back to that. And so I'm going to write my hypothesis test. And my HO would be, oops, my HO would be the mean for yes trained is the same as the mean for no trained versus my alternative that they're different. Okay, which one of these is true? Let's check, let's check it out by looking at the p-value. And that's given on tests of two categories. There it is, y and n. And look at that. We got a very small p-value in this case. That's, um, just to give you an idea, that p-value is, uh, here we got a p-value of 0 .0000000. 000 Four, six, two. So that's certainly less than 0 0.05. Remember, 0 0.05 is our standard. This number is certainly less than that. So we would reject the null. They are not the same with the alternative. So trained would be something that we would use as a potential improvement item. And in fact, notice that uh, this was the opposite of what people thought. People thought that if they're trained in the old software, they'd be able to grasp the new software quickly. But it looks like the opposite has happened. If they're trained in the old, they're using, maybe they're still using the old, and, and they're having trouble using the new. Okay? So the, that covers what I think is the most important um, uh, thing in the hypothesis testing um, uh, area. And, uh, and so uh, I realize that we have hit the top of the hour. And um, and so I want to say uh, thanks for thanks for listening. Uh, I'll just take a moment to to kind of summarize what we talked about today, um, and field any questions that you have. Um, so you know just to just to kind of reiterate, um, we talked about we started out by talking about um, um, we started out by talking about uh, 
uh, team tools. Remember that? We talk about converging and diverging tools. And keep in mind the BAM session. I think that's going to really help you. Um, we also talked about, um, I'm going to go to the whiteboard because that will give me a little bit of clean stuff here. So we talked about the team tools. Uh, we also talk about the central limit theorem. And what that says is it's kind of is a justification for hypothesis testing. Okay, it's the underpinning. And it says no matter what the underlying distribution is, X bar will have a distribution that is uh, that is normal. Okay, and it says a little bit more than that, but that's the basics. And then we talk about hypothesis testing slash confidence intervals. And there's a couple of things that we found out. First of all, we found out there's really only four that we're looking at. Testing means, testing sigmas, <clears throat> testing proportions, and eh, every once in a while we'll test medians. Okay? And that the structure is all the same. We say a null the means are the same, or the standard deviations are the same, or the, or the proportions are the same, versus an alternative where they're different. It always looks like this, okay? We always write it that way, and the way we decide which one is true is we look at the p-value. And if p is low, the null must go, okay? We reject, if p is low, we assume innocent until proven guilty. Innocent is not guilty. There's nothing going on unless that p-value is really small, beyond a, not beyond a shadow of a doubt, but beyond reasonable doubt, the null is not true. Therefore, we, we say the alternative must be true. Okay? That's it. All right. Uh, I wish you guys a good weekend, a great weekend, and uh, remember the assignments coming up. If you have any questions whatsoever, anytime, don't hesitate to call or email me. Um, always, always like to hear from you. And um, and that's it. Uh, remember, if you can, to uh, to uh, install the download uh, download the demo of Minitab. You can get it directly from the website, and I think that's going to help you a lot for next week. Um, and uh, and that's it. So I will uh, be happy to uh, to field uh, any questions uh, that any of you might have. Thanks a lot for uh, for uh, listening today. I'm going to stop the recording.